Generally, with this, our exotic portfolio, you're talking about needing sort of, there are something like 12, 13 independent bets most of the time. Whereas a standard CTA portfolio, it's a much, much smaller number. So diversification is one reason it works better. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another edition of Top Traders Unplugged, where today my co-host Moritz Siebert and I are joined by Doc Grinick, who is the founder, CEO, and CIO at Foreign Court Capital, a CTA that's backed by Swedish hedge fund platform giant, Brumer and Partners. Now, Doc, thanks so much for coming on the podcast with Moritz and me today. We really appreciate you spending some time with us today, and we're very excited about our conversation. Now, you have an interesting background and a unique start to your business. So why don't we start there? Tell us about your journey and how that has led you to the founding of Florin Court Capital. Well, I'm happy to do so, and I'm glad to be here. So my story is this. I studied economics as an undergraduate at Princeton and, and went on to get my PhD in pure mathematics at the University of California, Berkeley. And my career in finance really began at that time. Uh, I worked at Barra in Berkeley, California, with a number of uh, people who have gone on to great things, Ron Kahn, Peter Muller. And I was doing work as a quant in the equity space. After that, I went to Goldman Sachs, Fisher Black hired me. And I went first into fixed income research, and then I went on to the bond arbitrage desk at Goldman Sachs in New York. So I had a grounding in quantitatively oriented discretionary trading in fixed income and in macro. And I was in that job a number of years and then went on to Greenwich Capital, where I re first ran the proprietary trading desk. I should say one of the two proprietary trading desks and then went on to run mortgage trading and derivatives and a number of other things at the firm. So my background really is in fixed income quant and macro. Mm. And I have a pretty good grounding in discretionary trading from all of this. But I've been moving in a more systematic direction for a number of years. When I went to Fortress Investments, I went there to do systematic macro with the team <laughs> of people. Mm -hmm. And then after Fortress, I came to work at Man Group, where I had been hired to be the head of risk for AHL. And following that, I got additional responsibilities for the portfolio management group. And so it was at AHL where I really dug into the CTA space and deepened my understanding of systematic strategies. Yeah, I mean, it's that's a fascinating story, actually. And if I can just stay a little bit with it, you know, your transition from discretionary to systematic, I'm, I'm curious because I think a lot of people, you know, think about the advantages of one over the other. What what has been your experience? What What convinced you that maybe the systematic approach was where you wanted to focus your, your future? Well, systematic trading has a number of advantages over discretionary trading. It forces you to figure out ahead of time what you believe and what you're going to do in a given set of market circumstances. Discretionary traders, in a way, 
have models. The models are in their head. They have rules. They have ways of looking at the world. And in some cases, you can, you can take that, put it down on paper, test the hypothesis, and refine it. So there's a kind of empirical slash scientific process involved with systematic trading that is really quite compelling. You're really forced to state what you believe, why you believe it, and apply that and test it. And then when it comes time to do the actual trading, again, that discipline of following the models, following the process is invaluable. It it really is invaluable. In addition, you can apply it to a very large number of markets at the same time. You know, a good discretionary trader really can't look at too many different things and have a decent feel for them. Whereas once you've figured out the approach you're going to take systematically and you've, and you've tested it in a variety of places, you can apply it very broadly if appropriate. And so there's a tremendous strength to that process of testing ideas, applying them broadly, and then implementing the whole thing with, with absolute discipline. Sure. No, I, I couldn't agree more. Just out of curiosity, at the time when you started or you decided to, to start your own firm, a flooring court, where, where, where does that name stem from? Is that your location? or? Well, when I first arrived in London, I really wanted to get to know the city better. And so on the okay. weekends, I would take city tours, not the ones really for tourists, but walking tours for people who want to get to know specific neighborhoods and places and get off of the beaten track a little bit. And I remember I took a a, a tour of the neighborhood Clarkenwell, which is just up, just a bit north of the city. And I was fascinated by the neighborhood. It was a very, very cool neighborhood. It reminded me a little bit in some respects of downtown New York. And in Clarkenwell, there's a beautiful square called Charterhouse Square. And a lot of people don't know about it, but it's one of the most atmospheric places in London. You know, part of the square is a, is it a 14th century monastery that's largely intact and has an amazing history. And it, it's a really interesting place. And on the square, there's this beautiful Art Deco apartment building with a curved facade. And, and and the tour guide mentioned that this is a, a really special apartment building built in the 19th, I believe in 1930. And it actually has an indoor swimming pool, which was kind of special then. Sure. And and I said to myself, damn, I'd like to live here. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, it turns out that that building, Floor and Court, is one of the great Art Deco landmarks of London. It is the residence in the uh, fictional TV series, Hercule Poirot, of the the detective, and uh, just a lovely place to live. And so I moved in there and had this beautiful view of Charterhouse Square, and I could walk to work at my former employer. And, And so it was just a delightful place to live. That's where the name comes from. Sure. Wonderful. Beautiful story. Thanks for sharing. Now, you mentioned a couple of names that you've worked with in the past, like Peter Muller and and Fisher Black. Probably people know Fisher Black more than they know Mr. Muller. But I was just curious, along with this journey, were there any people, not necessarily these two gentlemen, but any other ones that that kind of had a big influence on on you as as in in, in, in your career at all or a mentor or anything like that? Oh, sure. I mean, I could, I could name a number of people who have influenced me. I mean, I, I try to learn from as many people as I can. And some people have a lot to offer. And, I, and it was really a privilege to work with some of the greats in the business. You know, I've been in the business a long time, and I've, I've been lucky to be in uh, or fortunate to be in really good places and working with some very colorful figures. Jacob Goldfield at Goldman Sachs, for example. Was, was one of the great traders. And he approached markets in a sort of Socratic way. If you offered a proposition and said, I think such and such will happen, or I think X is related to Y, 
he would start questioning you very, very skeptically. He, he was a person, you know, with a very, very incisive, or is a person with a very incisive mind and, you know, would never hesitate to challenge your assumptions. So I think I learned a great deal from him. I worked closely with Adam Levinson at Fortress, and I mm-hmm. think he's, uh, he, he now has a fund out in Singapore, Graticule, and I think he's one of the great macro traders I've ever known, both broad and deep. And I, I love the way he thinks about things. So I learned a great deal from him. And of course, I learned a tremendous amount in the quant work that I've done over the years. F- uh, Fisher Black was an inspiration. And more recently, in my employment at AHL, I worked enough with a number of super talented individuals. I want to stay with the early days of Florin Court Capital a bit longer and talk about some of the bigger decisions you had to deal with, such as putting the team together and also finding the backing to get started. Can you talk to us a little bit about how that all uh, came about? Sure, sure. So as I as I mentioned earlier, I spent a number of fantastic years at Greenwich Capital Markets running a prop trading desk, then running mortgage trading and and other businesses there. It was a fantastic firm with man for man about the best trading team I've ever seen. And I loved working there. It was a fantastic place. And one of our key relationships at Greenwich Capital was Brummer and Partners. In particular, Mm -hmm. we were quite close to the fixed income fund, Nectar. And so I would go up, I think it was like summer of 2002 or 2001, and visit Nectar and talk about my macro views and talk about relative value and fixed income and and different models we were using and approaches to mortgages and all that stuff. And and so I got to know the people at Brummer reasonably well. Now, that was 17 years ago. So after I left AHL in due course, and I was thinking about what I'd like to do, you know, one possibility was having a conversation with Brummer. And so they knew me already. And so I engaged them in a conversation. I've, you know, I talked with others as well. And with Brummer, it's a very easy fit because, you know, Brummer does a first class business in a first class way. They're really good people straightforward to deal with. They've been in the business of building hedge funds for a long time. They know a good team when they see one. And so things things develop naturally and and very, very nicely. And so, you know, I, uh, I talked to them about the idea of doing a different kind of CTA, a new kind of CTA with an emphasis on alternative markets, the more exotic markets that most CTAs don't touch. I mean, Mm. typical CTAs trade 100 standard developed market futures and FX forwards, that sort of thing. But there are literally hundreds of markets that they don't touch. Mm. And uh, to me, that is low-hanging fruit. And, And so I discussed with Brummer the idea of doing a CTA around markets like that, as well as trading different kinds of models in other markets. So I was very, very pleased when they, you know, they expressed interest in, in, in the enterprise. Sure. Sure. Well, having a a backing like, like Bromer uh, clearly, uh, I imagine make things a lot easier, but you still have to find good people to start off your business. How did you manage to, to put together such an experienced team from, from day one? Well, of course, I, I worked. I had worked with a lot of people at AHL, which is a terrific organization, to be sure. But at that particular point in time, there was a management change at AHL, mm-hmm. and some people got the jobs they wanted, and some people did not. And, and there was a little bit of tumult with some people leaving and other people coming. And so a number of the people whom I liked the best actually just became available or were already available just yeah. because of the the flow in my former organization and and so 
you know, I, I had an opportunity to bring on board Tony Vanitsky, who had already gone to Oxford to get his MBA, right? And sure. Tony is so important to what we do, I can't overemphasize it, because we trade operationally complex markets. Right. I mean, that's our raison d'etre, that, you know, we, we will trade markets that require work in order to trade. Maybe they're over the counter, maybe there are other complexities involved. And Tony had been the head of investment operations at AHL. And that's that, that's what Tony lives for. He loves this sure. stuff. And so I was able to offer him the role of COO and take pull him out of Oxford. Completely independently, one of my favorite guys, David Dennison, who's a terrific, terrific guy. He was leaving already. You know, he had already left, right? And sure. he had been the head of the FX sector. But what makes David special is he has pretty deep experience in equities. He had worked at the Putron Fund Management back in the day. He was obviously very experienced with momentum trading and CTA stuff. He's a terrific statistician, very strong figure, but he will roll up his sleeves and write code. So he very, very productive guy, and I thought he would make a wonderful number two, and so he has. And then Matt Stevenson, you know, he had gone off to do other things much earlier, and I thought Matt uh, was such a fabulous product specialist and explains the momentum story and exotic markets and so many other things so well. I thought he would be really terrific to head up our product management, and, and so on. And so I was able to pick up people that would really have been my f first choices anyway, sure. because they were already available. Yeah, absolutely. That's great, Doc. Maybe we can stay on those exotic markets for a while. I mean, most listeners may have heard of, say, you know, spot power or steel rebar or some of the smaller commodity markets, but maybe piquing their interest, could you just give us a brief overview of some of the real exotic markets which, which you trade? Well, certainly. Um, so if you first look at the power markets, you don't want to just be involved with Felix and Nordpool, although you know most CTAs aren't. But there are, there are the peripheral power markets throughout Europe. There's the U.S. So there's a lot to do in power. Then there are all the inputs to power, as well as carbon emissions at the other end. So there's a lot of stuff to trade in power, okay? In addition, in addition, you can also create some synthetic assets by looking at combinations of things. You, you know, you can look at the dark spread. You can look at the spark spread. There, there, there's plenty to look at. Uh, that's where you're comparing electricity with an input to its production. If you're talking about interest rate swaps, you have – More than one point on the curve, typically, in dozens of countries around the world, okay? So you're talking about Asia, Latin America, Eastern Europe. You can be involved in markets like Turkey. We did extremely well in August from the developing crisis in Turkey, which you know has been going on for some time but accelerated. Then when you're talking about exotic commodities, now an exotic commodity, uh, uh, you know, I want to correct a misimpression that may be out there in the market. You, you know, you don't go to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and circle some illiquid thing, right? Or a Chicago Board of Trade, that kind of thing, and circle some illiquid but standard thing, you know, I don't know, lumber or butter or something. That's not interesting. What's more interesting is trading something that's really unrelated. It may even have decent liquidity, onshore Chinese commodities. Now, uh, again, it requires a lot of work to get access to that. Okay, but we, but Tony and the team have put in the work, and we trade about three dozen onshore Chinese commodities at this point. You know, eggs, glass. You know, steel rebar. There, there are there are commodity markets around the world. South African wheat. So, you know, when you're looking at a portfolio that has French electricity, that has 
credit default swaps, Colombian interest rates, eggs and glass in China, cryptocurrency. You know, we have exposure to both Bitcoin and Ether. And we were probably the first or one of the very, very first CTAs to have that, even before the futures. You know, we try to push the envelope, but push it safely. Again, you know, we want to make sure all the pieces are in place so that there's proper, everything is done properly, you know, from beginning to end. And that takes work. But that's a, that's a very large part of what we do. You see, one approach to our business is to keep tweaking your models every three months or six months or one month and, and, and just try to keep improving the back test. But it really hasn't been shown that that produces better out of sample performance. I, I've, I'm not convinced. Another approach is to take tried and true models, but keep adding new diversifying markets by doing the operational work required to add them. Okay. And that's the game we're in. So you're you're using traditional trend following models and you're applying those to to those exotic markets. Do you do you think there's one key reason why trend following works better on those markets? Is it because at the other end of your trade you may have a commercial as opposed to another hedge fund trading the S&P 500? What what are the key differences there in your experience that that make those exotic markets easier or better to trade? Well, the first thing where I can argue very safely and soundly is that the portfolio is better diversified. It just is. Right. You can look at a, a standard CTA portfolio involving 50 to 100 developed markets and look at the returns generated by momentum systems on those markets and ask, how many bets are you making? You would use principal components analysis or another similar method to to get at the diversification of that portfolio. You can do the same thing for our portfolio, which has about, you know, approaching 250 macro markets and then cash equities as well, you know, well over a thousand of those. And when you do that analysis, you see that our portfolio, the portfolio we have has been historically, you know, two to three times better diversified. Okay. And, and there uh, again, there are different ways to measure it, but I will simply say it is significantly better diversified. You know, for example, you could ask what are the number of principal components needed to explain 70% of the variance of the returns from the systems on these markets. And generally, with this, our exotic portfolio, you're talking about needing sort of, there are something like 12, 13 independent bets most of the time. Whereas a standard CTA portfolio, it's a much, much smaller number. So diversification is one reason it works better. The second reason is it appears the trends are better. Now, it's easy. Uh, the diversification argument is more airtight. It's, it's actually very hard to argue against it. You know, it's, it's just right there. But hi, you can say that historically, say from 2010 to 2017, you know, the post-crisis period. Okay, if you look at the 50 standard CTA markets in the SG trend index, and you look at the sharp ratio of basic momentum systems on them, you'll discover that about 40% of the markets delivered over the eight-year period I've described, 2010 through 17 inclusive, about 40% delivered a negative sharp. When you go to exotics, that number drops to, you know, about 17%, cut in half. And if you look at the other extreme and say, okay, I'm looking for sharps of greater than a half on an individual market. Well, less than 20% of the standard markets have done that over that period. Whereas close to 30%, actually, if I count, include sharps above one, 
oh, it's going to be about 40 some percent of the markets that delivered that. So there are fewer bad markets in terms of, you know, the kind of choppiness that produces poor returns and many more excellent markets where individual markets are delivering sharps of a half or higher. I find that fascinating, Doc. And and I was wondering, do you have an explanation or an idea as to why that is? I mean, is it liquidity that just, you know, less liquidity, but then you get bigger trends? I mean, is there anything that that suggests or that should suggest that that eggs should be trending more than than you know live cattle for that matter or or could it just be that 2010 to 2017 which we know has been a difficult time for for trend followers for sure it's just an unusual period because of all the intervention and of course it goes to to argue your case that yes maybe there was a lot of intervention but that also means that a lot of CTAs are depending on you know a few liquid sectors but do you have any any thoughts on this these things well first off there's no question that the intervention of of central banks in the developed in the developed markets dampened the trends it did not allow the trends sure. to extend themselves particularly to the downside okay right. uh, that's certainly true i i don't think that the answer is liquidity because if you bucket markets by liquidity and then look at trend performance in, for example, the developed markets, because there are plenty of illiquid developed markets, I might add, I don't right. think you see very much in terms of a relationship like a higher sharp ratio with lower liquidity. I don't, I, I, there really isn't a consistent relationship there. I think another factor might be that I would rather have real economic players with different motives, you know, real hedgers on the other side Mm -hmm. than to be facing off against other CTAs with slightly different frequencies and other systematic shops. In most of the markets that we trade, systematic players are not a big part of the flow. They're just not. Yeah, And so who are the other people, uh, other players involved? They could be short-term speculators, but in many cases, they're hedgers. We know, for example, how the uh, utilities in Europe and so on hedge electricity prices as well as their input costs. So I think that's a factor. You know, if, if you mm-hmm. look at markets and sort of say, okay, I'm going to bucket them by the amount of CTA participation in the market. I think I think you will find a rough relationship, a, a rough one, indicating that markets where it's not just CTAs trading with each other <laughs> are markets where momentum performs better. But uh, mm-hmm. again, these relationships are noisy. You know, I think the factor you mentioned, central bank intervention in the developed, uh, in the developed economies, that played a role. I think the point that I'm making about Hedgers being a, a, a bigger part of the picture in, in some of the alternative markets, I think that's right too. You know. So does a market like, say, Kansas wheat or sugar still have a place in your portfolio? Or would you say, no, those are two standards. We're, we're only doing 100% pure exotics. Well, it, it doesn't really have a place now. The only, right. the only place where some of the developed markets will creep in is in the bucket of synthetic assets. Because we can sometimes create from a combination of other individual markets a synthetic market that has different properties from its constituents, individual constituents. Could you give us an example of that? Oh, a simple example is trading the yield curve slope. That would be an example of a synthetic market. And and I mentioned some earlier, the dark spread, the spark spread. So spread markets are synthetic markets, but actually you can do triples and quadruples and various combinations to achieve things. So you will see some of the developed markets showing up in places in our synthetic assets, but that's a relatively small part of our portfolio, and we're not trading them in a purely directional sense. 
we're trading the synthetic asset directionally, but not the individual component. Sure. You mentioned that you were trading, I think you mentioned around 250 markets or so. And, and, and it certainly seems like your research is really how do we add another uh, market rather than how do we tweak the model. So so how how big a universe? I mean, how much more is there to for you to 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 add to your playground, so to speak, in terms of markets? Well, we have a really uh, a, a really nice pipeline okay. of new things to add. Be- think about. I mean, there are so many things, but our goal is to continue to expand in a kind of organic way to add more and more diversifying assets to the portfolio. It's not like we said, we have the, these 200 or whatever, we're done. No, no, no. When you come, uh, you know, when we have this conversation in a couple of years, I think uh, some of the 250 will be gone. Yeah. Maybe they've been commoditized a bit and there'll be 150 new ones in there. Mm. But think about all of the -the over-the-counter markets that are tradable in so many different things. Mm. All of them are potential candidates, one by one. Some are more obvious than others. In addition, there are new commodity markets that, you know, again, we only in the last year have we been able to trade Chinese commodities. Mm. Let's see what the future holds for commodities in India, you know. And other right. places. So we're going to be hunting down additional over-the-counter markets, additional commodities markets. Cryptocurrency is an entirely new asset class. And you want to be involved absolutely in that asset class. And that doesn't require that you have a view that Bitcoin's great or Bitcoin sucks. Actually, sure. either way, <laughs> trading momentum on it can be a, a very, very sensible thing. Sure. Uh, I mean – in some ways, it's, uh, crypto is almost the perfect asset for momentum since there really isn't a clear notion of fundamental value. Are you trading the right. futures there or are you trading? Uh, we do trade the futures yeah. and other derivatives. The worst asset for momentum is probably something where the fundamental value is completely obvious. And then only an increment of information of some kind will cause a, you know, a, a step function like move in its value. The perfect thing is something where sentiment matters a great deal and where fundamental value in a way may actually depend in some ways on the price action. Sure. You know, if Bitcoin steadily grinds up, there'll be more and more interest, more and more acceptance, and who knows where it goes Mm. and vice versa. How do you, how do you determine whether a new market adds value? so, So to speak, I mean, how do you determine whether it's, different enough to to warrant a place in in your portfolio because i can imagine with all those markets you already have i mean at some point it'll be hard to i'm i'm guessing it'll it might get harder to to add additional diversification oh you bet that's a, that's a really great point of course it's harder to uh, you know at, at this point the program is so mature that every change you make is an increment you know right incremental improvement but but making a series of incremental improvements and you know maybe moving your sharp ratio over a, a period of time moving it up by 0.1 or sure. in, in expectation of course sure. that's an achievement you want to do it so the first thing is you, uh, the first thing is just common sense you look at the market and then you ask is it really adding something new mm. directionally to the program In some cases, adding a market adds nothing, really. The the market's so correlated with other things that you're trading. In other cases, it really is a different thing. Mm -hmm. The next thing, as I alluded to in answering so far, is that you look at the correlations, as well as the occurrence of tail events. I'm not only interested in the correlations on quiet days. I'm interested in correlations in the big moves as well. Mm -hmm. And... So you you basically look at that. In general, we will have a a bias in favor of adding things unless it is pretty clear that there isn't much value in it, you know, because things that kind of have been correlated empirically, but intellectually are not necessarily 
the same thing. They can they can become uncorrelated and decouple. Sure. By the way, take a look at the way U.S. interest rates have decoupled from Europe. It's quite remarkable. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Could we just go back to the uh, just for the cryptos to the cryptos for for just a little bit? You know, you can trade the Bitcoin futures, but you can trade Bitcoin spot. You can trade Ethereum spot. If you trade them spot. How does your custodian handle that? Where do you keep those coins? Precisely for this reason, we did not get involved in spot trading of crypto. Right. But there were other ways to get exposure even before the futures. So only the futures, the Bitcoin futures. Yes. But okay. right now, trading Bitcoin futures is a perfectly acceptable way of, of trading the main risk factor in crypto. In a sense, all crypto should be measured as a beta, you know, with a beta relative to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the benchmark for crypto. But Ethereum is an, uh, an interesting an interesting product. Just curiosity, since these markets are so different, can, can, you, can you apply the same trend-following model to, to all of them, or do you have to kind of adapt a little bit to this to the area or the sector or the type of of market uh, you trade well uh, here's where you do the adaptation first off you do, you do adapting based on liquidity you, you cannot trade at the same frequency and in a costly a liquid market than you can in a highly liquid market some of our exotic markets are pretty liquid some of them are much less liquid and so the speed of trading will reflect that. Another place where things enter in, where market differences matter, is where you set volatility floors. Any responsibly organized CTA program will do volatility scaling. Sure. Right. We all know what that is. But then the question becomes, what happens when short-term vol drops really low? Do you keep scaling up the position or do you have some floor or minimum volatility? some barrier, if you will, to prevent leverage from getting too high. And for markets that have a lot of kurtosis, the kurtosis being the fatness of the tail that is not explained by, by the second moment, by the, by the volatility, you, will put the vol you may put the volatility floor higher or have different position limits and risk limits for the sector. Now, what we're doing, because we're trading so many different assets, Our risk is divided up very, very well across, you know, a broad spectrum of positions. None of our positions, you know, will have the sort of risk concentration that you might that you would have in a call it a you know a fifty or seventy five market standard CTA program. So you know. We have these modest amounts of risk in all of these different assets, you know, from Chinese commodities to emerging market interest rates to, you know, electricity. And so in answer to your question, the models are very similar. Okay. The models are very similar. But, but by the way, that is also true in standard CTA programs, whether they're trading 50 or 75 markets, they will typically use pretty similar models right across the board with a few adjustments. In the markets, some people throw in some carry, you know, they adjust trading speed, but you don't want to be tweaking models for individual markets. You'll overfit them. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.